Hello, good morning, everyone. This is Tibetan Buddhist Society of Canberra's regular Sunday morning uh, meditation plus a talk. So here today uh, we will uh, firstly start a meditation. So all of you, uh, um, firstly I'll do the prayers in Tibetan. As some of you know, some of you don't know, but doesn't matter. Uh, I'll do the Tibetan the prayers, uh, refuge and for immeasurables, during which I s suggest you <coughs> tune in to your own sense of refuge or faith and affirmation in the good and the resolve to practice kindness and compassion uh, through the inspiration of the t teachings of the enlightened one, uh, which you, you are, if you are a student of, I'm sure you find you are finding many, many insights through the teachings how to live a kind and compassionate life. Uh, so um, I will do the prayers in Tibetan this morning. <coughs> So with these prayers, firstly, bring your attention to a very good sitting posture. So spend your time and try to get yourself seated in a correct posture that keeps your legs crossed in a sitting posture. Or if you're sitting on a chair, have your legs firmly grounded in the floor and then keep your back straight and your two hands in the meditation posture. Meditation means put your right hand on the left and then put the two thumbs touching and gently below your, two, below your navel and your arms and elbows relax and your back should be straight and then you must keep your eye, keep your chin slightly tucked in in order that you don't bend your neck on the side or, or far too back but slightly bending forward with eyes half open not totally closed no widely open or blinking keep the eyes soft and searing gaze your lips and teeth left natural your tongue slightly curled inside the upper teeth and have a sense of single hair pulling you towards the ceiling in this way spend at least for for the first part of this meditation, just getting your mind very focused in keeping the posture straight and still and correct and at the same time very comfortable. 
but not comfort in the sense of you you're slouching the back or leaning the back. Unless you have mobility issues, you should try to sit upright and try to bring your attention to God and mind this very posture. You will notice, check, am I, is my back straight? Are my shoulders balanced? And so, with this, you start try to become very focused in your mind on your posture of the body, calmly. So, try to spend some time perfecting this st stillness of the posture, and sincerely sitting in the right posture and with a serene attention that is not wavering or that is not distracted or wandering off the thoughts to anything, but try to just keep checking and correcting and doing the knowingly sit in the posture and see if you check doing the proper posture properly or not and try to feel wholeheartedly. And I'll leave you to it at least five minutes
while maintaining your posture. Now you shift your focus on following the in-breath and inhaling. You mindfully inhale, do the inhalation, think of positive thoughts, see the oxygen come and feel inspired while inhaling. Then as you permeate the breath in the lung, consciously spread it in your lung and flood your whole body with it and feel the whole blood cells inundated by the oxygen that rejuvenates, feel re-energized. And then as you exhale, as you breathe out consciously, let go of your tiredness and stress or feelings, difficulties in your mind. Just breathe out with the carbon, see it go out and feel relieved. Count that as one. Do the next even more carefully. At the end of exhalation, count that as two. Do the next one carefully, mindfully, doing, knowing, seeing, feeling, and then count that as three. So in this way, try to remain very focused in doing forward counting of qualified round of breathing. Do this while keeping your posture still, with sincere and wholehearted motivation, with serene and sharp attention, with very simple, just stay with your in-breath when inhaling, stay with the permeation breath when you're permeating, and stay with exhalation, mindfully know, do, see and feel your exhaling, and then do the counting. Unless you lose the count, which is not a really problem. If you can't lose the count, take a mini break. If you do not lose the count, which is possible, then keep counting without hurrying. Keep a same pace of each round of breath, so that more you count, more stable and calmer your mind gets. So with this mind, you do the forward counting of qualified round of breathing, okay? during this short time that I'll give you to do that.
keeping one's posture still and sharp attention. Now we will shift to do the reverse counting. So if you reach, say, 40 or 30 or 20, whatever, you count backwards. But you do each of the rounds of breath a little bit more highly resolved clarity of concentration. If that is so, it's called super qualified round of breath. So that you're inhaling, you see where you're inhaling from, through where, and see the gentle beginning, and then peak, and then the conclusion of the inhalation, during which you feel inspired. And then as you permeate, it also has a gentle beginning, a peak, and conclusion. And likewise, as you exhale, it is a s carbon comes gently, and then slowly it swells, and then it slowly tapers off. So in this way, you do each super qualified. Super qualified means qualified doing, qualified knowing, qualifiedly seeing, and qualifiedly feeling. So you stay very present in each round of breath. When you finish the exhalation, count that as 30 or whatever. And then next one is 29. And next one at the end of the exhalation, 28. Try to do that very clearly and focus as you are really truly with the meditation in doing the reverse counting of each super qualified round breath without any touch of dullness or laziness, forgetting what to do, stay fully present, mindfully and introspectively, and do this with great sense of purpose and dignity.
<clears throat> so, it is always good to learn how to sit still, whether it's a very formal meditation or not. Every now and then, even if it's five minutes, you try to sit still and be present with your breath, with your posture, with your good heart, and so on. So, uh, now uh, I'm going to uh, give a short talk on the theme of understanding sentient beings. Um, today, in particularly, focusing on sentient beings who we love, who we have a filial duty to care or to protect or to uh, to provide or to be attentive to because if, if it's not a con not a uh, not because we are religious or anything like that not because we're buddhist or anything like, but just fact that we are who we are we have at least number of people who are in our karmic circle who towards whom we have this strong love for and also it's possible that they also do the same towards us. So when you, are, when you have this feeling of affection or love or commitment towards someone, what we call sentient being who we love, you can't really love somebody uh, unless you, you, know them, uh, uh, you know them so well. So we usually don't know even those we love. So, therefore, as the theme of this talk is understanding sentient being who we love. You know, so think of who are the people in a list of maybe half a dozen. You know, maybe the top two people in your life, you know. Who are they, you know? Who are these people? Maybe they are your mother. Maybe they're your father. Maybe that's your father's husband or wife or child or whatever, you know. And, and think of who, why you have this strong a bond or commitment or the need to love or to give to them, uh, these people, than to anybody else. So it's very interesting that we have some sentient beings we call those loved ones, you know, the loved sentient beings. And this, I'm not talking necessarily people who, who a man get attracted to a woman or, or husband or wife. So it's, it could be your, your husband or wife too, you know, that to whom you have strong love, you know. Um, but, uh, but in this case, you think of your mother, for instance, think of your father, for instance, think of your child, for instance, towards whom you have this natural feeling of how much you love them, how much your willing ability to, to do things for them and make them happy makes you much more happier than you yourself are able to do that yourself. You rather do that for them to make them happy. And, uh, and so there are such people in our lives, so karmically speaking. Are they karmically, we love them? Or we just feel we love them so much? Is it because they do so much things to us? Or is it because we just naturally feel that love? Because when you think about the people we love, uh, they like we're talking about men loving a woman, or vice versa. That's like a finite object. of. That's I'm not talking about here. But it is possible that that you may regard the person who you love uh, as a sentient being. But do we understand those people who we love? And uh, usually we don't. We don't understand the sentient beings uh, who we love. We actually want them to be happy, or we want them to be like this, like that. We don't want him to do this or go there. And we have uh, all this amazing kind of controlling mechanism to, to the people we think we love. We don't want them to do this or go there or be that or do that. Uh, we want them to be in a particular box, sitting there. So, but do, they, do the people we love actually expect that? Uh, uh, do, under, do they understand these are our expectations? And are they will, have they agreed to, to live by those uh, expectations? Probably not, because they haven't even understood these are the things that we've been expecting of them. So there's assumption between us and other sentient beings who we love that what we think they should do. And then we, when we, uh, and that's all in our head, you know, it's all in our head, you know. What we want them to be and what them to do or don't do or be here or be not there. 
So we have this very fixed view of what the, what the, what these people we love should do or shouldn't do or, or whatever. So this, this assumption makes ourselves least able to understand and communicate to the person we love. Because the person we love actually have certain expectations from their own end as well. How much uh, they expect us to be thinking of them, treating to them, or not treating to them in a particular way, is also a completely new area. We have here got hardly any expect any understanding of what they are. So sentient beings, particularly those who are very close to each other, they actually don't know understand each other at all. They don't understand how much of unrealistic expectation we have of them and they have of us. And neither of them has bothered to communicate that these are your expectations. And sometimes it's probably even better that you don't spell out all the expectation because if you, they do, then they'd be disappointed. They, how come you want me to do all of that? What do you think I am? They feel their individuality or their sense of themselves as a person is being, being sort of uh, compromised because we want them to, to, to be like this. So therefore... We, much of the people's problem uh, often uh, happens with people who they think they love. Maybe they, they loved each other mutually for a while, for a long time, but something didn't go very well. That's because we do not understand the loved ones. Loved one has just as much as expectation of us as much as we have towards them. So this mutual expectation, which is neither communicated nor understood, uh, no assess carefully creates a huge cause for misunderstanding. So that's why understanding sentient beings, particularly who we loved one, uh, shows that we really, we are actually we don't really love them. We want them to do A, B, C, D, so that we are happy. The actual love sentient beings. If you really love sentient beings, you want to make them happy by doing whatever that they want you to do, that we usually don't have such unconditional commitment to give and do and, and things for the other's happiness. We are not. We actually want them to receive what we give and go where we want them to go or do particular things so that they become cause of our happiness. See, we don't understand sentient beings who we, who we think we love. We are possessing of them. We are possessive of them. We are subordinating them. We are almost enslaving them to be a cause of our happiness. And they have no idea that is, a, that, that is our expectation and verse, vice versa. If they too have this, this expectation of us and they want us to be, behave in a particular way and, uh, and uh, do particular things that, that, that pleases them, and don't do certain things that upset them. They also have this all the list of things that they think that we are in, uh, meant to be doing because we are the son, or we are the wife, or we are the father, or we are the, uh, the uh, friend, or whatever it is. They also have this huge list of expectation as they love us. Because they love us, they want us to do certain things that, are, that, they make, that make them happy, and we fail to do those, then they are miserable. Oh, so there, therefore, lots of the misunderstanding and unhappiness or discontentment that we have of each other is largely because we think we love somebody, uh, but yet we have not, and we didn't do anything to make them happy, but we, them, we want them to become, to do certain things to make us happy because we think we love them, you know. And therefore, we, we have a certain fixed expectation of what they ought to do to make us happy. So there's both sides has this huge expectation and uh, wantings and needs from each other. And so that's the only reason it seems that we, we, we do things for them, we give things to them, we want them to uh, write to us, we want them to, uh, you know, in a, treat in a particular way. For instance, if somebody uh, loves you and... Um, and you didn't, didn't want their attention because you are, you are not interested in the love kind of attention they're giving. You know? 
And then they, if you don't give the, give the kind of uh, responsive love towards them, and then they think rejected. For instance, <laughs> they think reject, they feel rejected. Uh, why? Because they want to be accepted by their desire or love towards us, and, we, uh, and they, they want us to accept them unconditionally and then fulfill their desire or wish because they love us. You know? you, I'm sure some of you would have experienced that, and uh, I must say, I have experienced that too, you know, quite a lot, in fact, you know, you know, you know, I'm the, not the sort of person who put my hands on anybody, but I, I have, I have, I have people putting their hands all over me. And when they, when, when they, when they, when, when they realize I, I am not uh, going to entertain that kind of attention, and they feel rejected, and then they feel angry, and then they feel jealous. <laughs> and then they feel if, 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 if I'm a little close to somebody, and then they become jealous. They think it's awful. This, this, that shouldn't happen. But if it happened with them, it would be quite okay, you know. Do you realize how least we understand people who we think we love each other? Or at least one loves the other, other one is... Of course, I love, like we, we, as a Buddhist, we should love all sentient beings, but we, we, we're not interested in that kind of finite love that people attack to try to trap you with a this, with this commitment to, to love them like that. So, so very complex, very complex. And, and do, you, do, you, do you unconditionally accept somebody's love because they love you? No. So, Therefore, there are lots of people who have been, who have, who feel angry at somebody because they didn't get what they want. Yeah, they didn't get what they want from you, thinking they love us, <laughs> thinking they love us. But but actually, definitely, love is trying to make them happy, and provide the causes of happiness from your side. No, it's the other way around. They want us. They're so needy to make them happy, by. By responding to their, to their own desires, to their own expectation. When that's not fulfilled, then, you know, they think they loved you. Now they hate you. Why? They are not, you are not responding to their expected desires. And then, and they are jealous that you may have some closer friendship with somebody. And you know what happened? Then that becomes cause of their, their aversion, anger, rejection, or whatever, you know. Yeah. So, I'm sure, I'm sure if you have done that, you will know that. If you have tried to show some attention to somebody, and they, they're not showing, and you think you love them, don't you? Uh, but what does it mean you love them? Actually, you want them. You want them for your own carnal desires. You want them for your own whatever mundane, material, financial, social or whatever economic, whatever benefit by the showing your attention to somebody. So your, your attention to somebody is not love at all. It was attachment. It was desire. It was possessiveness. So often when we think people are loved ones, they actually are possessors. They possess you. They want to control you. They want to make sure that they, you do exactly what they want you to do to make them happy. But are they able to do things to make you happy? You know? <laughs> are they willing to do everything what you want? Probably not. So that's why, if this is happening from your side as well, which is, which is not an if, but also happening, so therefore, two peoples, what appears to be loving relationship is, is, is full of, full of uh, time bombs, you know? That it will not go very well. Why? We don't understand sentient beings in general, particularly those who we think we love them, or those who we think they love us. You expect your father to love you, don't you? Yeah. So, if you, think, if you expect your father to love you, what do you want your father to do? This, 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 this. You have lots of things. What, you want hi, your father to be like his father, uh, like his father, but you, you, your father isn't quite right. Your father hasn't quite done any of those. So you will see. So this shows psychologically that you are actually 
your love for your father is not love. Your love for your father is attachment, expectation, and con control, and, and uh, an unrealistic expectation. So that is, because of that, 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 that relationship between you and your father is going to, going to explode one day, if not very frequently. Why? Because there is so much misunderstanding, miscommunication, and wrong view. So we have to really understand how these things happen quite a lot of the time. And then people misunderstand, people miscommunicate, people assume things, and they just assume things, that's what they, the other one is doing or, or wanting. But you haven't ever actually checked with them, is that's what they're doing or that's what they want. So therefore, when we don't understand sentient beings in general, how can we understand anybody out there? We don't even know who they are. But even those people, we think we love them, or, that, or, or we, those people, we think they love us. And we think we, they love us, but what does it mean? You know, They have given you some things, they have done things for you, and then you're for, therefore you're indebted and you want to do similar or better things to them. So this kind of reciprocal uh, kind of a kindness, generosity, doing things for each other, and, uh, and then you did this, and then they have to do that, and they have to do that, and then we have to do that. So this kind of uh, obligatory giving and taking, giving and taking, often sort of uh, makes us sometimes even more mean. They say, what did I do? What did they do to me? If they loved me, did, what did they do to me? So we wanted to almost become... We wanted to be calculative and very mean as what, want, what we want other person to do if they love me. So there's a lot of children, uh, for instance, who never satisfied with the father or the mother or both, you know, but it's never equal. You know, they, ne they feel one person loving more towards them, but they don't feel the same towards the other. No wonder why. So this shows that... that the, we least understand sentient beings who we think we love them or they, we think they love us or they should love us. Or some people even expect we should love them in a particular way. Why? Because they're desiring us. We want to look at them. We want to do things for them. We want to go with them. We want to, to, to entertain their desires. Because that's their, that's their expectation. They're desiring that and they think they love us. They don't love us. How can love is not not so 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 simple? Loving kindness is a high virtue. Loving kindness is creating happiness and causes of happiness to the other without any reward seeking mind, and that's it, you know. But most human beings' relationship with loved one is not like that. They actually do things for each other in order to, because one has the need to give to somebody, not because one that the person you need to want to give to doesn't need that. We want them to have it because we want them to have it to make us happy. So it wasn't so it wasn't to make them happy. It's good to loving kindness is to make other person become happy or please please by us doing some things or giving something or not doing certain things, you know. For instance, our mother, maybe we don't want to go out late or don't drink or don't, don't you know, take, alcohol, take alcohol or uh, take narcotic substance. If th that's what our mother, mother did not want us to do that, you know. Mother did not, did not was, because she loved us that, so that because she knows that if we did that, we, we, will make, we will, will be meeting with bad friends, and we'll be wasting our money and we will be, we'll be harming our body and your per career and all of that. And quite a lot of people who love us really want us to behave in a way that is actually not harmful to them or shameful to them. Because otherwise they feel shameful because their son did that or their mother did that or, or like that. So, so you become the cause of their misery. <laughs> you supposed to be become cause of their happiness, but what you do has become cause of misery. Why? Because they think they love us. Do you think they love us and therefore they become, we become cause of their misery? It's strange, isn't it? 
Why we become cause of their misery? It's because they want us to do particular things to make them happy. Amazing, you know. They can't make them happy in their own head, and they they expect we they expect us to make them happy in our head and our behavior. So you can see, sentient beings don't understand each other because they don't understand their own mind. They always project. They always expect something or expectation of the other or desiring them to do A, B, C, you know. So probably each of us, therefore, have more people who are miserable towards us, who are angry at us, who are, who are aversive to us, than they are uh, fantastically happy with you. Why? Because if their happiness comes from your doing certain things like like nothing personal but very good things that generally become very happy and rejoice your good deeds, then that will be that will be totally different thing. But if their expectation and desire for us is is one that is poisoning their perspect their perception and that's that's going to be going to remain huge burden for them as well as us. So sentient beings don't understand. Like some people may, may not have a lot of thing to do with the parents. Why? You have to ask why they have no longer much to do with the parents directly or indirectly. Is it because they don't love them? No, they love them so much that they just hate being close to them. Because they are such a they don't have they have huge disappointment and expectations and they have no 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 intention of reconciling with that. They think it is them who made, the, made, made, uh, made you miserable. It is his action that made you miserable. And they, uh, they want to believe that. And so until almost this irreparable damage is done because they love each other. You know? This love is not love. This is attachment. This is possessiveness. This is clinging to something that doesn't exist even, let alone to cling to. There, is, there actually isn't even the thing that exists. One just assumed, one just imagined how they ought to be, how do they ought to be like a, how, or how a father ought to be. They actually project what a perfect father is in other people's father. They can't see the father that is in their father. They are so mean, they are so like a hungry ghost. Our loved one become hungry ghost. You know, our loved one a hungry ghost. It's not that you don't know and have to go far into the sort of bottom of Bodh Gaya to find the taunt, the, the colony of hungry ghosts and find out what they're like. You will find hungry ghosts in your midst of those people. We think they love us or we think they think that we love them. <laughs> so more, more, more mutual expectation there is, the more disappointment they have. Why? They, we can never do right. We're never the right father. The perfect father is out there. It's his father that's perfect. It's not my father. And then one has this strong sense of, of inadequacy and rejection and shame of not having the right father who loves them. Maybe father loves them so much, but he doesn't get a chance to, chance to near them, go near them. Because, because, he, because they have rejected him over whatever issues. So what happened with the love? How come? How come loving relationship has been, become rejected and shame and, uh, and uh, uh, cause of aversion, at the same time loneliness? So we don't understand sentient beings. We think sentient beings are there to love and be nice to each other. They're not. They become quickly become cause of strife and discontentment. Why? Because we don't understand sentient beings. So to understand sentient beings, we have to understand our own delusion of other sentient beings. A lot of the things that we think sentient beings are are not the fact. They are our projections. When you have desire, we want them to be doing this. We, just, we see things in them that they lack. And we think they are there. And they should be able to do that. So our projected perception is, is, is only, only on our imagination. But we think, no, it's, it's always there. So we often don't understand sentient beings, particularly those 
sentient beings towards whom we have afflictions, with affliction called attachment, with affliction called expectation, with affliction called you know uh, and uh, respect. We want uh, we want we we want ourselves to have somebody like this so that so that you have a decent father. You know, we think we have this special box father how he ought to be. We have this amazing criteria for what a father ought to be, and uh, like a superman or a superhuman being or something. No, even Buddha had difficulty of being being seen as a good father, and so on. And uh, so, in a period, certain period of time in life of Buddha's son, for instance, Rahula and uh, and uh, and his mother uh, Yashoda, he def- definitely they would have quite a few things to say about Buddha, or what kind of father he is or isn't. Why? Because their tainted mind of grasping and expecting and clinging to him as their father and husband, they couldn't see anything in that because their love became love became attachment, possessiveness, expectation. So quite a lot of people's heartache and disappointment have always come from to do with their loved ones. So due to their loved ones, being in our life, people have difficulty of letting go. So they have either attached to someone out of fondness or attached to someone out of out of aversion. And previously they loved them, now they have aversion to them. So in this case, most people's suffering comes from their wrong association, their wrong attitude, and their misunderstanding about the sentient beings who we regard them as those who we love. Now, not everybody will be in the same, same, same situation. Some people's relationship with the loved ones are mutually beneficial and they're not a cause of disappointment. They might even think that both are really happy with each other. It might go for a good four, five, six, ten years. And you know, there's a lot of, lot of people's relationships like their, their respect and friendship have stayed that way for a good few, ten, five, ten years. After that, something, something happened, all of a sudden they're gone, disappeared. And they disappear. Why? Because the, the, their wrong view of what the friend is, to what the loved one is, they think it should be permanent. They think the person and the personality, the entity, is permanent. He should be always like that, spotlessly, never change anything, and he, he should be always like that. If something different person lives, a situation changes, then we no longer love him. Why? That shows we never love them. We actually want them. We desire them. We want them to be possessed by our, our expectation. We want them to be doing this so that we are happy. So it wasn't anything to make them happy, but we use them to make ourselves happy. So this is, the, this is happening all around. And that's why we don't understand sentient being. So understanding sentient being requires us to understand our thought, our mind, and we need to therefore sit back and reflect in our thoughts. How much of our thoughts is our thoughts and not the person let alone the loved one. What we think someone is, is our only projection. When we think we love them, they look lovely. When we don't, they don't. So, so they're still your mother. They're still your father. They're still your husband. They're still your brother. They're still whatever your best friend they were. But how, how come your mind switches from one to another? So it's not what they're doing, but our own mind that is so fickle, that is, that is so volatile, and, and, and it's, it's got the very, very, it, has, it does not understand sentient being. Why? And sentient beings are only our reflection. Saint, there is nobody who's there that are them. They're only our opinions. So, someone we think we love them, it's because you have an opinion that you think you love them. But do they want your love? Oh, you're not allowed to love them. Particularly if you want them, particularly if you desire them, you know, you're not meant to do that. It is not proper for you to do that. But do you know that? No. You think it's, you think it's quite, quite okay to do that. So when people are craving for after you, for, for whatever, from your financial or whatever your uh, goodness are, they want to get something from you, 
And they think they love you. That's not love. That's attachment. They're craving. They're craving things for you. They're craving things from you. And they want to do A, B, C by you so that they are happy. So if you don't, if you don't, if you fail to do that, which you most likely to do, they will be disappointed. But did you know they have expectation of that? No, you didn't. You didn't have. You have hardly fulfilled your own ex self expectation of yourself. But how could you fulfill expectation of all these other people? That's why, that's why sentient beings only create a cause for harm and problem to each other, seldom associating with full with the full benefit each other. They always harm each other unconsciously and un, uh, inadvertently. And that's why uh, people's uh, loving relationship with, the, with the fellow sentient beings often become cause of discord. So, when we, when we understand sentient beings who has more expectation, who desire something from you, and when they do not get, they will be disappointed. So if you have few people who are angry with you, uh, or maybe if you're angry with someone, it's, you know why? The reverse psychology is because you didn't get what they want. You didn't get what you want from them, isn't it? That's why you're miserable. You think you love them. You think you loved them. You think you respected them. Now you're miserable. Is it because it's their fault? You think so. It's, you, you don't know that. You are on unrealistic expectation. Your own anger, your own craving and desire were not fulfilled by the said person. So, so it's not fault of him or her. They don't even know that they, are, they have been placed with such expectation. They didn't sign a contract to you saying they will do this, this, this to you to make you happy. It was all in your head what they should be doing, shouldn't, shouldn't be doing. And now all of a sudden you change to you, flip your mind like a coin, and then you, and then you, have, the, you have the reverse side of it. You thought you loved them, now you hate them. You thought you couldn't uh, you know, part from them, now you don't want anything to do with them. So who are they? Once upon a time, you thought you loved them. Why you didn't love them now? It's because you never did. You only desired them. You only wanted to subordinate them. You craved after them. You have carnal desire after them. And therefore, you are now not happy. So, this is very important. If you understand sentient beings, you understand your neurosis. Because what you see of the sentient beings are not anything about them, but it's all your projection of them. Your projection of them. So if you're not, if you're happy with someone right, right, right now, if someone, it's also, it's all because of your imagining these things. They might be trying their best. They may have some good reasons, good qualities, good good conduct or whatever, but, you know, these things are uh, all dependent. They don't have an inherently existing good conduct. They don't have an inherently existing loving mind or generous mind. Its, it's question is, if he's generous to you and you want him to be generous, you will think he's great. But he, if he's generous but you want, don't want him to be generous to you, 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 you reject him. So what is the same thing being? Same thing being generosity to you can either become cause of happiness or of your anger because you don't want him to give anything to you. That's so. So why? Because you don't want to accept things from him if, if you have to do things that, do, that you don't want to do. So that shows that all the sentient beings and all, lots of people's problems in their mind is a is, is largely their misreading of other sentient beings, particularly so-called loved ones. You don't understand those who you think you love them. You're actually treating them as if they should be like a little uh, pawns or slaves to make you happy exactly as you like him. You know, they never can make you happy by doing what you want them to do because they have a head of their own mind of their own, craving of their own, even if they are very, very saintly and they're very, very polite and generous, you will never get happiness, inner happiness from them because you yourself, your perception and projection of them is entirely uh, you know, in, in negative. 
and craving and desire. So craving and desire often confused as love. You know, you think of somebody who, if they really want you, you know, it's because they want you, not because they love you. You know, what do you mean by love? Loving kindness in Buddhism is creating happiness, a cause of happiness for the other. If you love your mother, you make her happy. Um, you, and you, you try to do things to make her happy. That's love. But you'd want your mother to do A, B, C to make you happy is not desire. That is, that's a, that is not love. That is desire. You, des you want her to be like this so that you are happy. You are not able to do things to make her happy, which is that, that's why love and kindness is much harder to practice than desire. Desire, everybody's practicing. His question is, well, who towards whom they have a desirous mind? And, uh, and uh, so just, just maybe you can reflect back. They, if there are some people who are disappointed and angry with you, you know, chances are they desired you. They desire you. They want you. They want you to do A, B, C. They want you to be like this, 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 uh, whatever. Or they want you yourself for, for them. And because they didn't get it, they are angry. They are jealous. They usually speak bad things about, against you and behind your back. Why? Because, because they, you thought they loved you, and yet they thought they loved you, but no, they desired after you. They were craving after you. They had completely different expectation of what you had to be. Because they did not get it, hence they are angry. Hence they are discontented. Hence they are disappointed. So therefore, sentient beings, particularly those we think uh, have, a, have a loving relationship to each other, uh, are, are to be renounced. One should, one should re recon reconsider what is the real emotional uh, feeling that one has for other. Is that a spiritual loving kindness or, or ordinary desire and possessiveness and control? And most people, sentient beings, loving relationship is the latter. And that is very hard sort of pill to swallow for most people. They don't realize they're not conscious of their own choice of thoughts, feelings, emotion towards others. And instead of thinking that we love them, uh, we, instead of the fact that we don't really love them, we want them. So wanting something from them and loving them and doing something to make them happy is totally different. You know, they may look both similar, but they're very, very different. The, the virtue of loving kindness, if you love somebody, is that you know, you do things to make, make them happy, and, uh, and uh, to that comes a delight to you. You, did, you couldn't even have happiness that, to use that for yourself. But when you gave it to someone, it made you happy. So with this in mind, you can part the gift you give in to the other person, makes them happy, and we're also happy. So we are actually able to create cause and condition to make the other person happy uh, under on unconditionally not wanting anything them to do or be and uh, reciprocate us. So if we have a need to, for them to reciprocate what good we did today, that's not love. That's just another kind of business transaction. You want, you want them to have this so that they can do that, do this, this, this later. That kind of ulterior motive does not understand sentient beings does not even understand your own self as a sentient being. How could you understand other sentient beings when you can disunderstand yourself, the sentient being, who are usually miserable and suffering as a result of uh, lack of this competency? So according to the teachings of the Buddha, you know, people who are loved ones, are, are, we should fulfill certain duties, whether as a parent looking after children or, or a grown-up person repaying the kindness of parents. There are certain social expectations. What a son and children should treat the parents, how a husband and a wife should treat each other, and so on. So there's a little bit of social kind of expectation, how a loving husband, loving uh, wife, or they, they should do to each other. But this kind of a social expectation, norms with, by which people expect and to do things, of course, uh, uh, they think they understand each other. 
but often they don't. They only they only see the they only see the surface of what they know each other, but they actually don't know that the other one is a other one is a merely projection of yourself. And because your mind is very fickle and changeable, and your perception of the loved ones will change from good to bad, bad to worse. And also it's possible non-existing relationship become existent and maybe it will peak for a while and all of a sudden go downhill. That's the nature of things. It's not because your husband is bad or your father is bad or your friend is bad or they are, they are not up to the, not unlike other fathers. No, it's nature of all things. All sentient beings changes. And you yourself change many times, haven't you? To the disappointment of even yourself, let alone other people. So when somebody changes, they backflip, and they reverse, and, and they don't turn away, don't be disappointed. Because they are, it's not them, it's your attachment that you feel rejected. You know, If they, you don't have attachment to them, you don't feel rejected. You feel nothing. So therefore, it's not the loved one's fault. It's your own emotional instability that makes you to misunderstand uh, what loved ones are. Loved ones are, are only your objects of thought that you think you love them. What does it mean? You, know, you want them to be a, a fixed entity that has no head or brain of their own? Of course they're not. They are human beings. They too have their own expectation of you, which you don't, didn't know they have. So there's no mutual understanding of what loved ones should be doing to each other, but yet they are both uh, having huge expectation, huge craving and desire what we want them, the other, to do so that we think we are loved. That kind of a, uh, a waiting for this love, that you don't find much love, is because the sentient beings are not capable of loving other sentient beings unless their own desires wish is fulfilled. And this kind of self-centeredness often impedes uh, our usefulness of being alive, even for ourselves, let alone for others. That's why disappointment and sadness and, and a deterioration relationship between loved ones is inevitable. So don't even think that it's your fault or your loved one's fault. It's nature of existence. It's the nature of water is fluid and nature of fire is burning nature of loving relationship will be hating relationship. Also, loving, uh, the nature of hating relationship will not stay long and also can change into loving relationships. So because of that, we, should, we mustn't misunderstand other sentient beings as if they're doing that we cannot love them or the, if they're not being that, we cannot love them. Don't think like that. If you, are really, if you really understand sentient beings, Who's, whole, who's vulnerable, who doesn't know the ha happiness and cause of happiness, who doesn't know the suffering and cause of suffering, because of that they are confused and deluded. And if you're not among them, you have the advantage of treating them with even more compassion, for they don't understand all the above. And if they are among the loved ones of yours, you should actually treat them even more gently, rather than have this strong craving and wanting and desirous expectation of the loved ones. You know, even if you gave millions, don't expect them to be returning those in more than a million. You know, maybe maybe it, it was you, you needed to give them give it to them so that you feel good, isn't it? So maybe they didn't want to receive yours. You know, who want to receive the thing that you give with with so much, so much conditions? Most people feel wish they never had had to accept your gift, your miserable gift or your miserable love that's cause more cause of suffering than any, any benefit. So that's why it's very important to understand sentient beings. Uh, particularly we think we love them, and uh, particularly we think they should love us. Why? You know, what is love? What is sentient beings who love each other? You know, do they really know what's love? Do they really know how to make someone happy? If they do, have they made themselves happy? If they haven't, how can they make someone happy? So don't idolize even yourself to be perfect father or perfect mother or perfect this. Don't try to idolize anyone, including yourself. 
This doesn't mean you should be complacent and not try your try your right effort. This mean, doesn't mean that, but don't become attached to your performance, even if you are immaculate mother, you are a very well loved mother or father. You know, even that is a, is a, is a relative. Uh, you might be a good mother, but how, whether whether you are a good sister, whether you are a good auntie, whether you are a good good colleague to somebody, it's a totally different case. You might be a good mother to the only child, you know, but how about other people, you know? Yeah, the son thinks his mother is great, but the but the lady who who at the workplace he's got a totally different interpretation by others. See, sentient beings are not understood. Only the son understands the mother, and she he loves her, uh, but she's not able to give that much love to others. Why? Because she only gives that to her son. <laughs> see, see, this is the whole thing. That's not the whole of the mother. If the mother was as kind as she is to her son, to everyone, that would be quite a different matter. But they are not. Why? Because they are sentient beings. They're doing that out of attachment. They're doing that out of filial duty to feel important, to feel valuable, to feel I'm a great mother or whatever. But they are not willing to do that. After a while, they actually wish they don't have to be a mother also. So, so, so there will be a time that the, the loving mother actually doesn't want to be a mother anymore. She couldn't even think of having another child. She just wished it never, she, it never happened, but she, she just did. So... There's very many rooms for misunderstanding between us and sentient beings who we think we are loved ones. So we have a lot of learning to do about how to understand sentient beings by changing, by knowing our own mind and its opinions, how the sentient beings are painted as a picture in our mind and we think that's they are. Are they identical to what we think they are? Or are they completely different what, what they should be or they are? You know? Often uh, we do not know. We don't understand sentient beings because we don't know these are our own imaginations. So with this in mind, one needs to learn to uh, let go the fixed views. Uh, don't, don't put anyone in the box. And don't stay yourself in the box. Try to get out of that and to see, not become fixated about that. So understanding sentient beings is not an easy, it's very difficult. We don't understand sentient beings because we are not enlightened. That's the difference. If we are enlightened, we will understand sentient beings with a lot of light of compassion, how lost and confused and, mis and miscommunicated sentient beings are towards each other. And the Buddha knows this. Buddha knows this. But sentient beings hardly know this. And that's the difference. And then when we meditate, it might help to clarify this and bring some kind of light and so that we do not stay stuck in that dark corner. So with this we will conclude here, everyone. Thank you very much. So understanding sentient beings is a very important uh, uh, way to uh, deepen your knowledge of the Dharma and enlightenment that can come from it. Thank you very much. That's all. See you next time.